Good evening, everyone. Hi, Eric, how are you doing? Hey, I'm great, how are you? I am doing well, thanks. I think we're still waiting for a couple folks to join us. Okay. Um, but while we do, let me just say congratulations. Very excited for your win. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, um, you know, people were asking me today, how are you? I'm like, I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, yes. It's It's been, um, you know, we've been campaigning since May 1st, 2019. So it's been a long time, but we're excited. So thank you. Excellent. I'm just having some technical difficulties here. Excuse me. That's right. <laughs> um, one of the things that I loved about your campaign was I saw the TikTok from the young man who was so inspired by you. I don't know if you want to tell folks about that a little bit. Sure. So let me get my glasses on. Hello, Representative Morrison. Hey, Rep or, I'm sorry, Senator McBride. Yes. Hey, David. Hey, so glad you could jump on the call with us. So sorry I'm a little late. It's one of those days where, uh, you know, you lose track of time very quickly. No worries. Eric was just telling us, I don't know if you saw the video of the young man on TikTok who was inspired by Eric's campaign. No. Have you heard about this? No. T yeah. Tell us all about it. We actually, there were actually, and I'm trying to think, uh, there were two TikTok videos um, I think the one you're probably talking of, yeah, the one was more funny, but I think the one that you're talking about was where he talked about my being a female impersonator and how um, it just gave him confidence, you know, in general that he could be who he wanted to be. And, you know, he, um, I think it almost sounded like he, um, you know, felt like he had to be pushed in this stereotypical uh, masculine box and that it gave him hope that he felt like he could express who he really is. And, you know, and that was nice because, you know, we have such rigid gender norms in, in, in America in a lot of ways. It's certainly getting better. But when I saw that, it, it was really inspiring. And it was fun. It was then there was a funny one that got like 240,000 views. So it was nice. And they both kind of came out right around the same time. So there was this really touching one and this really funny one. So it was a nice balance. If you have them, can you send them to me? I'd love yeah. to see those. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. We all have to learn how to use TikTok now, apparently. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I am, um, I'm, I'm, I'm 30, but I have not mastered TikTok. And, uh, my only instances where I'm ever on TikTok is when people text me a TikTok to watch. Exactly. Well, Sarah, so many people were inspired by your campaign as well. I've seen some great things on Twitter. And I saw that you said last night, you know, that even if you know, one LGBTQ kid saw your campaign and was inspired by it and felt included in democracy, that that was such a powerful thing. Yeah, it, it, it's you know, th throughout today, um, it's starting to sink in. Um, and I think it takes time because I think for so long, um, so many of us thought that our ability to, to run and win and, and serve was impossible. And growing up, it, 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 as I've said before, seemed so impossible that it was almost incomprehensible. And so I think today it, it's sort of taking time to to sink in that, you know, we've 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 not only the three of us have, have not only won, but we're about to serve together and we're gonna create an LGBT caucus, LGBTQ caucus. And one of the things that's helped uh, you know uh, helped allow me to to fully realize the reality of this is the messages and emails and the tweets and the the, the comments from LGBTQ young people, particularly young trans people who are sharing that one trans, one, one trans teenager sent me a, an email that said that this was the first time he has felt hopeful since he came out as trans. Um, and to, to know that we are collectively sending that message to LGBTQ young people here in Delaware and elsewhere it's a real privilege. And I think all of us know that the only way to honor that, that message and our community is to do the best job we can for the residents of our respective districts, to make sure that we are 
are doing the job to the best of our ability and, and making progress on a whole host of issues, including equality. Um, and that if we do that, we'll, we'll, we'll make our collective communities proud. That's beautiful, thank you. Um, for those young people that are watching, our Camp Rehoboth LGBTQ youth and any other youth around the country, I'm just wondering, what advice would you guys give them um, if they were thinking about running for office? Eric, you want to go first? Okay. Sure. Um, I, you know, uh, it, it, it's um, cliche, but the old Nike thing, just do it. I mean, you know, when, when I started my campaign or even started talking about it, um, there were people who said, you know, okay, but you, you can't be seen as the gay candidate. You can't be seen as the gay candidate. And it really bothered me because, you know, I understood where they were coming from because I, I never wanted to be the gay candidate. Um, I didn't want anyone voting for me because I'm gay. You know, I, I wanted people voting for me because they know my history of community service. They know that I've worked with seniors and they know I've worked in education and they believe in my progressive policy platform and all of that. Um, so, but, you know, it, it is inspiring. And, and I would say um, another thing that actually more than the, the gay thing with me, what I got hit on a lot was the fact that I'm a female impersonator. And I was really shocked that the gay thing was kind of, yeah, okay, that's cool. But then, especially when my opponent in the primary, unfortunately, made some, some very... Um, rather undignified remarks about a drag show fundraiser that we had, you know, it, it, it that floored me that, um, you know, and again, to me, it came into that whole issue of gender roles and, and, and how we like to stick people in boxes and see them in a certain way. Fortunately, we had so many people who were so supportive of it. But, um, you know, it's sad because, you know, I had a lot of support in the, in the LGBTQ community, but I actually had um, at least two gay men I could name, but of course I won't, um, who actually, they disagreed with me on some political issues. So they actually said on social media, you should just stick to being a drag queen. And that was very disappointing to me because, you know, to see that with our, within our own committee, uh, community um, and to see someone think, obviously, that if you're a female impersonator, drag performer, whatever you consider it, then you're less than. You should just stick to being that. Kind of how AOC is told, you know, hey, stick to being a bartender, you know, as if you're less than. Um, but again, to all you, to all the young people, get out there and do it. Before you do it, get out there, get involved in campaigns, learn about campaigns, learn about the issues, do community work, prepare yourself, but don't think that you can't do it because you can't. Wonderful. Sarah, do you want to add anything? Yeah, well, first off, amen. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really powerful looking at, I think particularly, um, you know, our two campaigns, Eric, um, is that we both, I think, in different settings, and I think um, you, even more publicly, faced um, oppositions at various points that that traded in anti-LGBTQ stereotypes and, 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 and prejudice. And what I think is really, really positive and what I, I am so reassured by is that in both instances, er, in, in Eric's instance twice, right? I mean, the attacks were made in the primary, he won the primary, and obviously the attacks have been made in the primary, so they were out there anyone the general and in my case the attacks came really after the primary um but in both of in, in all of those cases voters in our districts were fair-minded right they were they were they were hearing those messages to the degree that they heard them for what they were which were acts of desperation which were dangerous discriminatory messages um that didn't frankly you know they're not going to hurt my feelings or Eric's feelings, but what those messages do is they hurt other people. They hurt LGBTQ young people. They hurt LGBTQ people living in poverty, LGBTQ people who are struggling to survive, who don't have the support structures that Eric and I have. And so what I am so, so pleased to see, and, and I'm not surprised by it, but what I'm so pleased to see is the fact that those types of attacks 
not only didn't work, but in, 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 in many ways made us stronger. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think for anyone who's thinking about running for office, who's LGBTQ, know that our identities, our community is our superpower. And that whenever they throw attacks our way, we end up growing stronger. Not only do they not work, but we come out better and stronger and with more energy and more support. And that's, I think, the story of our movement. Every single time anti-equality politicians come for our community, we end up having a conversation with our community and our country. We end up opening hearts and changing minds. And in the end, so the seeds of the destruction of the politics of hate they seek to implement. And that is the story of our movement. That's the story of Eric's campaign. I think in a smaller sense, that's part of the story of, of my campaign. And I am so hopeful that that's the takeaway. And I hope that it inspires other people to know that it's not that it's always going to be an easy path, but that you can do this and that the voters are ready, more than ready. I know. Wonderful. One I was just going to piggyback on something. It reminded me um, of when Sarah and I were texting one night um, because we had said, you know, we're a little bit older. I'm, I'm older than Sarah. Yes, I am. Um, but, um, you know, we've had that chance to develop that thicker skin. So with us, uh, you know, I see things now that are that that people say about the about me or or what have you, and it really it doesn't phase me because I'm at a point in my life it just it it doesn't even register, but it is so crucial for young people to see others standing up standing up to that kind of hatred and bigotry, and not just young people. You know, I know a, I know a gentleman who came out in his late seventies after his wife passed away. So it's not just young people, it's anybody out there who is wondering, who am I really? Wonderful. I'm going to Facebook to see questions, but you don't have a lot of questions. You have a lot of congratulations. Um, Peter Schott from Stonewall Pack is watching and congratulating you. Many of our board members at Camp Rehoboth, Eric, uh, I mean, Wes Combs, um, Chris Beagle, Leslie Sinclair, all send their best regards to you guys, to both of you. And um, yeah, lots of great words of encouragement. So you'll have to check those out when you get, when you get done. Um, tell us a little bit, and I should mention, we have one other big winner, Marie Pinckney. Marie um, was coming from a meeting, so she could not join us. She may pop in at some point during our conversation. Um, but tell us a little bit about what you think the LGBTQ priorities are for Delaware, you know, as we look to, you know, to your terms. What, Sarah, do you wanna you can start? Sure, um, you know, I think that we have made historic progress here in Delaware, but there's still certainly more to do. Um, the fight for equality is never over. One of, the, one of the things I like to think about when, when we're talking about the fight for equality in our movement is the, the line in our constitution about forming a more perfect union. And in that statement is the implicit acknowledgement that the only constant in our country is change. And the same is true for the LGBTQ community. We find comfort and hope in the progress we've made, but we actually then use that to fuel us to move forward. And so I think there are a whole host of issues that we need to continue to address here in Delaware. First, obviously, we know that LGBTQ young people in our schools continue to face bullying. And our many of our schools are either under-resourced in terms of the support or unwilling to protect LGBTQ young people. And so we certainly need to make sure that Delaware creates public schools that serve every student, no matter their sexual orientation or gender identity. And let me add that comply with federal civil rights laws. The second thing I think that we need to do is we need to join the growing number of states that have passed a ban on the gay and trans panic defense so that everyone understands that violence against our community is wrong, period. That there is no excuse for violence. And that when we allow those types of, of panic defenses to exist and go unrebutted and unchallenged by our law, 
we validate the prejudice at the heart of the violence and discrimination that our community faces. And so banning the gay and, pan gay and trans panic defenses is, is critical. But then of course, beyond that, and, and this is something I've worked on a lot at the Human Rights Campaign, is that we know that for LGBTQ people, while we have unique and heightened needs, we also have the same pre-existing needs as everyone else in our community. And, and that means making sure that we have an economy that works for everyone. It means making sure that everyone can get the health care that they need, including same-sex couples who are trying to start a family, trans people who are trying to get medically necessary care, uh, people living with HIV who need treatment, and all of us who need preventative services and, and care. Um, it means making sure that we're ensuring housing as a right for everyone. We know our community struggles disproportionately with homelessness. And so my governing philosophy is the Audre Lorde quote that there's no such thing as a single issue cause because no one lives single issue lives. And so as we go there, I know one of the things I'm so excited about this LGBTQ caucus is I think all of us are uniquely aware of the fact that our LGBTQ identities don't just make us powerful messengers on issues that are specifically around gender identity and sexual orientation, but also give us lived experience and a capacity to advocate for change on a whole host of issues that intersect with our community. Wonderful. Eric, do you want to add anything? That's wonderful. I feel like Sarah just took us to church and I love it. Um, <laughs> But, and I love, absolutely, I love, Sarah, how you talked about the intersectionality of issues because it's so important. You know, we are not just LGBTQ people. We are affected by the minimum wage. We are affected by affordable health care. We are affected by um, environmental conditions. Uh, 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 LGBTQ people of color who are in less affluent areas are disproportionately affected by air pollution. All of it, all of it is, is, is so intersectional. Um, and I love, Sarah, I want to work with you on banning that panic defense. I love that. Yes. Um, something I am very interested in is a number of states, or at least a few of them, have started passing laws that um, um, LGBTQ history must be taught in public schools. And that's something I'm very interested in working on because, again, we need young people to be able to see themselves in their education and, and as they're growing up and not just see reflections of themselves, but see positive reflections, positive role models. We need Harvey Milk in the history books. We need people like uh, authors like James Baldwin and Audre Lorde taught in the English classes. Uh, we need the Stonewall riots and, and, and all of that taught in, in history classes. And two, I want to work to bring in, you know, I, I do feel that after marriage equality passed um, in different states and then nationally, some, some LGBTQ people got a little complacent and kind of fell back and said, okay, we, we got marriage. Uh, thank goodness we're done. There are a lot of other things to fight for. We're talking about LGBT youth and you know, uh, uh, huge rates of homelessness, substance abuse, and uh, depression, anxiety, um, self-harm, suicide. We're talking about older um, LGBT folks who, especially who are single, who feel alone. We're talking about denial of nursing home visits. We're talking about, so we need to look at, at the entire community. We're talking about uh, prejudice, unfortunately, even within our own community against LGBTQ folks of color, against the trans community. So bringing the community together uh, is something I think that we'll be able to do by standing up and being representatives of that. Wonderful. Uh, Linda Gregory uh, wants to know who will be part of the LGBTQ caucus. I'm assuming the three of you will, but. So um, that's a great question. And actually Eric Mar and Marie and I haven't actually sat down to sort of talk through the <laughs> logistics. Um, you know, it, I, I think it's, it's it, there are kind of two models, candidly. I think there's a model for a caucus where it's just the out members. There's also a model that you have in the US Congress where the LGBT out LGBTQ members are the chairs of the caucus, but then you invite allies in to be members of the caucus. Um, that's something that I think Eric Murray uh, and I will, uh, will, will chat about, uh, but it's just gonna be so exciting that we'll actually have multiple people at that meeting. Absolutely. 
Um, I know all three of you were endorsed by the Victory Fund and got support from some other organizations along the way. Are there any any that you want to highlight or send shout outs to or thank? Eric, do you want to go first and then? Oh God, I mean, you know, the past the past day or so has I have been so filled with gratitude and thoughts of people to thank. I actually um, started earlier typing up my official thank you email and I had to stop because I just got I'm like, I, I, I got so overwhelmed with all of it. Um, you know, but certainly the LGBTQ Victory Fund. Um, you know, I've worked, I, I wrote for Camp Rehoboth, letters from Camp Rehoboth for many years, you know, so Camp Rehoboth has a special place in my heart. Um, I was president of Delaware Pride and on the board for many years. And so a lot of these organizations, whether or not they endorse me, you know, the Rainbow Corral, AIDS Delaware, they've supported me in so many other ways throughout my entire life. So, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it, it, it's, it's not just about which groups endorsed me for my elections. It, it's all the wonderful groups and individuals in the community who've supported me over the years. Wonderful. Sarah? Uh, sorry, I just got a text message from someone saying, you're, you're trending on Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. I sure Tumblr. Um, uh, well, I feel like Tumblr is all LGBTQ people, so that's not a surprise. But, uh, uh, you know, there are so many groups and, and advocates, I think, that, that, uh, that have contributed to these, these races. Obviously, the Victory Fund was a, a huge part. Um, uh, LPAC, Human Rights Campaign, where I work, has been incredibly supportive. Um, uh, D Delaware Stonewall. Y you know, one of the things that, that I, I am very cognizant of is that Eric, Marie, and I stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, that our candidacies and our victories are only possible because of the historic change that so many people have helped bring about both in the United States writ large, but then specifically here in Delaware. So, you know, whether we're talking about Delaware Stonewall, Equality Delaware, um, all of the organizations Eric mentioned that are, that are, you know, bringing joy and providing services, um, the individual advocates um, who have, have blazed those trails, Karen Peterson, who was the first openly LGBTQ person to serve in the legislature. Um, you know, we stand on their shoulders and, and, and this first meeting of the LGBTQ caucus that we're going to have is going to be because of the decades of work of people who are here with us today, but also people who are no longer with us, uh, like Steve Elkins and, and, and so many wonderful people that we've, we've lost just in the last few years. And then of course, in the decades before. And one thing I'll, I'll jump on and, and is, is. It's so exciting that there are three of us, you know, it's not one of us, it's not two of us, it's three of us. We went from zero to three, and I'm excited too about the diversity amongst us. You know, you have a, a gay white ma male female impersonator, you know, uh, uh, you have a, um, um, a wonderful trans woman, and you have a uh, lesbian queer identifying person female of color. So I'm so excited that there's three of us, that there's not just one or two of us and the diversity. And, and it's, it's really going to be, to go from zero to three, I just feel like, you know, you got to leap from A to Z and it's wonderful. Yeah, we, I mean, we have uh, effectively the, almost the entire acronym yeah. in, in, our, in our caucus. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Nice. Um, I've got another question. Um, from Chandler, um, Chandler says, I know you represent Northern Delaware, um, but do you also plan to fight for issues that impact, impact LGBTQ folks in Sussex County? Um, and what would you say to folks in lower, lower, slower Delaware? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in on that one first, if that's okay. And I honestly, I, I think Sarah grew, you grew up, at, up here, up here, right? In Northern Delaware. Yeah. So I will share this, and I don't know who knows this. I grew up in Bridgeville, which is in Western Sussex. You know, when, when, I tell, when I tell people I'm gay and I grew up in Southern Delaware, a lot of them will go, oh, you grew up at the beaches. No, 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 no. I grew up in Bridgeville. And, 
and, and, and especially during growing up in the late 70s and 80s uh, and, and early 90s, Bridgeville, you know, was a very different place than even it is now. And it was very, very hard. And I do think that I had uh, different experiences than maybe people who grew up, um, you know, in northern Delaware. Um, I know things have gotten a lot better. I mean, they even have, um, you know, LGBT student associations down there in some of the schools. Um, but I am well aware on a very deeply personal level how different things can be when you're talking about being LGBTQ in southern Delaware and down towards that way and, and being up here. One thing that I've had in my head all along that I want to do, and this is just a small thing, but I want to go to my high school and my junior high school, and if they'll have me, and hopefully after, you know, with COVID and all that, but I want to go in and speak and I want to talk to them. And I don't want it to be just about my sexual orientation, but I want that to be a big part of it. And I want to, I want to reach out to, uh, and I've worked with a lot of the, the student associations and, and, and hosted a lot of their events as my alter ego, but I really want to work with them across the state and especially down in Southern Delaware. Wonderful. Well, I know you guys are going to, or you both are going to have to jump off in a little bit. Um, it's a busy day for both of you, I can imagine. It's been a long day. Do you get a little vacation after this? A little vacation? <laughs> At any any rate, um, any last words you, you want to say to folks before you leave? Oh, Sarah, you're on, on mute. Yeah, I, you'd think at a certain point we'd figure out how to Zoom, uh, but I'm still having trouble. Uh, I may be 30, but I've clearly not mastered the technology thing. I, I just want to say thank you. You know, Eric said how filled with gratitude he is. That's exactly the, the, right, the, the right way of putting it. I am filled with gratitude uh, for all of the people who help support all of us who, who you know, spent time volunteering for us, who donated, who shared it, shared our posts on Facebook and social media, who, who voted for us, for those who might be watching. Um, and, and so I'm incredibly grateful. Um, our, our community has really, I think, come out in force this election to show our power, um, to show how motivated we are, uh, to, 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 to reinforce the principle that a true and healthy democracy has to include all of our voices. And I am so grateful to be part of this beautiful Delaware community, this beautiful Delaware LGBTQ community. And I just want to say thank you for the work that you were doing, David and, and, and Camp. Um, and I can't wait to work with Eric and Marie to support our LGBTQ uh, fellow Delawareans, no matter what side of the canal they live on. And uh, <laughs> I know we'll be together to celebrate in person at some point soon. Wonderful. Eric, any last parting thoughts? I think Sarah said all that perfectly and really just kind of said everything that was in my heart. So, so yeah, so just thank you to everyone. And I'm looking forward to working with Sarah and Marie and all the wonderful organizations and, and folks here in Delaware. Wonderful. Um, we're looking forward to working with you. Um, this is a really exciting time for uh, Delaware and so glad that you both took some time out of your schedules, which I know are busy today to join us. So with that, we will say good night. Thank you both for being part of the discussion and we'll talk soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>